Great. Well, good to good to ha have you with us. And uh, uh, why don't you tell us uh, what you've seen in the last seven months in terms of some of these issues? Okay. Well, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Ryan Lucky, and I I am with the Free Store Food Bank. I'm at the Free Store Food Bank. I'm the director of our Public Benefit Services, um, which helps uh, individuals um, get food stamps or SNAP, Medicaid. Um, we help those who are homeless get expedited Social Security uh, benefits. Um, I also oversee our representative payee program for those who, who are recipients of Social Security or SSI, but are deemed um, unable to effectively manage their, their funds. And so roughly, uh, my connection with Christ Church, uh, with the Free Store, um, we have a outreach assistance grant. Um, it started 11 years ago, um, which was the intent was to help doing the, the 5,000 club dinners every Tuesday, um, help those who are coming who may be in need of life documents such as birth certificates, IDs. Um, they may need help with transportation to and from work. Um, so for the past 10 years, uh, which stopped, uh, we took a pause back in March, I would be there every Tuesday, um, helping those who were guests to the dinner. I would also help those in need of rent and utility assistance with the funds that we had at the Free Store Food Bank, or I would refer them uh, to the Plum Line Ministry of Christ Church Cathedral, which is a rent assistance program. So as a result of the pandemic and um, the church deciding not to um, allow people to come and, and do face-to-face -face interactions. That affected the plumb line volunteers um, who were um, members of the church but um, could not come and meet with the clients. So what happened was that the church wanted to make sure that it did not stop its um, assistance um, to the community, decided to kind of augment it a little bit. So since March, I've been working with Crystal Jones, who's uh, the secretary at Christ Church, and we've been helping those in need of rent assistance through the Plum Line Ministry. And we're talking with Crystal. Um, I want to get get, a, uh, get her opinion of what she saw in terms of volume of calls and inquiries. She said back when the pandemic hit, she probably was getting a hundred calls a week, um, just inquiring about rent assistance, which doubled. Normally she would she would see 50 calls, but that uh, doubled to a hundred. And now it's kind of slowed down because the church only helps with partial rent. And so we're only helping those um, who, who fit the income, not necessarily the income guideline, but who can be really helped with the uh, small portion that we give them. And so those who owe um, a significant amount, um, Crystal is referring them back to one of the agents who can refer to Christ Church. Um, but from the Free Star side, We've also been fortunate to be one of the recipients of the Hamilton County CARES funds, which help those who have been impacted financially by COVID-19 um, with either rent or utility assistance. And so that started probably at the end of July. And right now it's due to end on December 30th, unless legislation passes um, in Congress to extend the CARES money. Um, and so with that, we've really seen the face uh, of poverty of those um, who typically would not ask for rental utility assistance, similar to back in 2008, we're seeing that that face of population. So as, as Mr. Woods already mentioned, we already, you know, we, we had those who were already marginalized financially anyway, but then you couple it with the pandemic, which adds to another um, group of people who are, have, who are now marginalized. So I was sharing with Mike Truett earlier that, um, I've helped a couple of families whose rents were almost $1,700 a month, which who normally would not ask for rent assistance, but due to the job loss, they are faced with um, the point of almost being homeless. Um, and, and unfortunately, even at, even with the, the calls that we began at the free store uh, through our benefit call center, we celebrated back on October 15th speaking with 2,000 people who are inquiring about just rent and utility assistance, which before the free store, we would do it on a part-time level. Now it has become almost an all agency effort at our customer connection center on Liberty Street. Um, and so it entails all finances, all backgrounds, all neighborhoods in Hamilton County. 
I don't know if anyone had any questions over what I just went over thus far about, about the demand for rent utility assistance. Maybe we should stay the questions till we get all okay. our panelists giving us an overview. So if Michael Pruitt, uh, Truett would uh, give us an update on the kind of the food assistance uh, that the three stores seeing, that would be very helpful. Absolutely. So it's nice to meet everybody. My name is Michael Truitt. I am the Director of Community Partnerships and Programs with the Free Store Food Bank. Um, so a lot of what Free Store does as far as food distribution uh, goes above and beyond what we normally do with our downtown food pantry. We actually support uh, the better part of 500 community partners and, uh, and program host sites with food distribution. So pretty much immediately once COVID had uh, hit in early March, we saw the demand uh, almost double within the span of a week or two, especially once that lockdown hit. So traditionally where we would be distributing, give or take 2 million pounds, or I'm sorry, 2 million meals a month, uh, in the span of April, May, and June, that number actually uh, approached 4 million meals a month that we are distributing through our partnership network um, in Ohio, Kentucky, and Indiana. Uh, it slowed down slightly, but still in the realm of about three and a half million meals per month. So across the board, kind of if we're speaking at the highest level, we've seen about 40% uh, increase in demand for food, um, but that does look different for different areas. Um, we've seen kind of a I think a unique situation with our partnership network. So our partners have either uh, seen their, the demand in their neighborhoods triple. So in areas like Elmwood that are traditionally underserved and under-resourced, one of our community partners there, Highland Avenue Baptist Church, uh, is distributing 50, 60,000 meals every Saturday directly into their community. Um, whereas traditionally that number was closer to 10 to 15,000 pounds. Now those areas have tripled. We've seen five or 10 of our neighborhood food pantries almost triple in size. Um, and then we've also seen a unique pattern of we've onboarded and partnered with since March about, uh, what's that number there, uh, about 60 new partner agencies since March. And traditionally we only partner with about 15 or 20 in, in a year. So we've seen a lot of the rural areas that traditionally the population was very small and either the, the small food drives at their local churches, or we've also seen communities that uh, traditionally you would not think would ever need food now have. So Columbia, Tusculum, for example, a neighborhood that's traditionally not thought of as one that necessarily has needs, had a partner step up and uh, now needs to support their community with some food distribution events. Um, to help those in need in a neighborhood that was traditionally not necessarily one that you'd, you'd serve. So um, the areas in need, especially already affected communities, the need is sometimes as high as triple. We've seen a pattern of a few communities that uh, traditionally hadn't either needed services or were able to, that were, were able to manage without free store assistance. Um, but then kind of oddly, there's a few communities that actually the need's been um, relatively stable. So it's, you know, I, we haven't looked into the socioeconomic status of those communities. Maybe those were ones that tend to have more stable jobs, but not necessarily like the, the Forest Park, Hyde Park communities where you expect it with a higher income. But even some of our middle class communities, the, the, the um, partners supporting those, it's either tripled stayed the same or there's been these new customers in, in, in areas of town that traditionally hasn't needed support. So as a whole 40%, but then if we break it down, there's kind of that pattern of, of extreme need, stable need or new need. Yeah, I'm sure there are gonna be some questions about the capacity for doing mm -hmm. these things. Uh, why don't we get on to quickly go on to John Schreider in terms of what we're what we're faced with in terms of eviction uh, evictions, because I think there's some confusion in people's minds because of certain limitations that were put on evictions for a while. And uh, what's what's the situation now, John? Well, thanks, Bill. And can you hear me all right? Yeah. Great, great. Well, thank you for inviting me. 
and, and I want to express my appreciation to both Ryan and Michael for their uh, good description of the very important work that the free store is doing. Um, you know, with respect to eviction prevention, uh, the free store is one of three key agencies. Uh, it's the free store, the community action agency, and Talbert House that are distributing the CARES money uh, that's still available yet this year to assist tenants who are behind in their rent and, and facing eviction. It's, it's really important work, and we're working very closely with those agencies as we at Legal Aid represent uh, tenants in eviction cases and try to make sure that tenants are given the opportunity to catch up on their rent and not be uh, put out of their housing and made, and made homeless. So I'll say uh, a bit more about the current eviction crisis, but um, I think it's important to talk a little bit about policy and to recognize the fact that, and I think Ryan referred to this earlier, we had a housing crisis before the pandemic. Uh, there was a huge gap in affordable housing that we've talked about previously at forums uh, with Christchurch, uh, the 40,000 gap in affordable housing for lower income households in Hamilton County. And uh, we also had the distinction of being one of the uh, places in the United States that had a, a way higher than the average eviction rate. So things were bad even before the pandemic hit. And uh, obviously, the pandemic has just made things even even worse. Um, I, I also want to mention that uh, homeowners are uh, being affected by the pandemic. We haven't seen a huge uptake in foreclosures, but unfortunately, I'll say yet, yet because we know that the uh, economy is um, still struggling and people are getting behind on their mortgage payments. So we have this situation where both with respect to evictions and with um, uh, homeownership foreclosures, where a, a number of uh, tenants and homeowners are benefiting temporarily from delays in court processes, uh, but those uh, delays are going away. So for example, the moratorium, so to speak, well, it's not a moratorium, the CDC order that provided a halt on evictions was uh, didn't cover everyone and has not covered everyone. And uh, to the extent that it has, ha has helped some people, it will be going away as things stand at the end of the year. So um, what, what that leads to is we have a critical need for extending the assistance that's available to lower income uh, tenants and homeowners. And I think Ryan mentioned this too. It's, um, you know, without getting into anything remotely resembling partisanship, we need for Congress to extend and increase the amount of assistance that's available uh, into, the, into the coming year. And, you know, uh, fortunately we're in a position here where we have two senators uh, Senator Brown and Senator Portman, who have expressed interest, uh, a, a lot of interest in these issues. And I think it's really important for us as um, residents of uh, Cincinnati, Hamilton County, and Ohio to um, communicate with them about the need to address and prevent the housing problems uh, that, that we're facing here um, in Southwest Ohio and in all of Ohio. The other thing that I want to mention, I know we had a, want to have a discussion, but I do want to mention one other very important thing. Even though we have a crisis and a huge gap, we have a huge opportunity. Hopefully, the new government in Washington, both Congress and the administration, are going to recognize that we have an opportunity to make substantial public investment in dealing with the affordable housing crisis. And that is something we must do. And it's something that is going to, if we do it, have a huge impact. It'll not only help the families and others who need good affordable housing, but it will help our neighborhoods. It'll help the whole community. And you know, the other thing is, it'll help the economy. Developing, renovating affordable housing is a great way to help rebuild our economy. You know, it's not a new idea, 
a hundred years ago, I'm sure everybody on this call knows that the New Deal called for development of affordable housing as part of a jobs program and solving housing problems. And that's when the public housing program began. And we need that kind of investment big time again. And it will result in helping families and others who need affordable housing. It'll create jobs. It'll create jobs in the United States. And it'll help our economy. And it's, it's, a, it's an opportunity that we, I, I, I just really hope we do not miss here. So that's, that's what I'll say now. And I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thanks. Thanks, John. Um, uh, Josh, Josh doesn't seem to be with us. So we may, we'll carry on with the three, three of you because you've already provided some really valuable information in terms of what you're all facing and what so many people in this area are facing. One, one thing I'd add to, to, to John, uh, John is also the chair of the uh, Advocates for Affordable Housing here. And I'm part of that group. And, and of course, we've always depended on the federal government to do the assisted housing, a variety of programs. But over the years, that has shrunk considerably uh, since uh, the Reagan years, especially. And so we need to do more locally. And of course, a foot is a, a ballot initiative that signatures are currently being collected for. Uh, for the Affordable Housing Trust Fund, which hopefully will get on the ballot by next May, but that would uh, considerably up the participation locally of funding for affordable housing if that issue gets to the ballot. Um, so I just wanted to put in a plug for that. Getting back to the three of you, um, what, what, what are we facing in terms of other the re resources in terms of John, you're, a couple of you have talked about the need for a more more federal funding since the COVID assisted uh, programs that were passed earlier this summer and have been stalled in Congress. What are what are we all facing? What are we you all facing in terms of uh, the assistance that we need in terms of funding and that kind of thing? How about the free store? Again, in terms of funding for us, um, as I mentioned, that we have been fortunate to get funds from Hamilton County um, to help with those facing um, eviction needs now. However, as I mentioned, that those funds will end on December 30th as of now. And we've also noticed that those who are receiving unemployment back in March, that is ended. And so um, when you're going to see less resources for agencies to help, and then you're going to see those with zero income because unemployment has ended, um, you, you are going to see eviction start spiking up at some point. Um, and so it, it doesn't look great, um, but in the here and now, we're just trying to do all that we can um, to prevent those from being, um, from being homeless. And I'll let Michael share on the food side. So on the, the food side, the free store essentially has three sources of our supply chain. Uh, the primary source in a non-COVID world is uh, government product, the commodities. That accounts for about half of our supply chain, but we have real no control over that. That's just what farmers grow in excess, free store gets. Um, then about 25%, I'm sorry, about 40% is donated food, either at a corporate level, canned food drives, et cetera, and then about 10% is purchased. Uh, so really the primary control that we have over our supply chain is food that we buy um, that we've been distributing to our partners completely free of charge, so out of pocket. So in order for us to be able to increase the surge in, in demand for our product, it essentially comes down to financial resources and the flow of that. Um, now, sometimes government funds does come with uh, some administrative fees, but that is more on a reimbursement. So in order for us to continue to meet the demand, it's essentially how much do we have in in revenue coming in either through donations or uh, grants, et cetera, to be able to offset the cost of that purchase product. Um, because that's really the only way for us to meet surges in demand um, 
on a day to day. And then in the COVID world, when we're talking about 50 to 300% surges in demand, depending on um, kind of the nuances of the supply chain. Now we're really talking about, we need finances to address the flexibility. Uh, right now it's, it's looking favorable, but November and December, I think is normally, I forget what they say, 40% or 60% of our fundraising. It always goes down in election years. And with everything going on, there's just a lot of, um, a lot of unknowns in what fundraising looks like for nonprofits outside of kind of that federal, state, local support. Uh, so kind of to Ryan's, to echo Ryan's point right now, okay, but uh, but there's a tunnel and we're not sure how long we're going to continue to get these fundings with, with a political environment, with a donation environment, with everything else going on. Any plans that we have to be have to kind of first, well, it's a flexible plan. Well, we're hoping for if things continue in the way that they have been, we'll be able to make do. But any small changes could greatly impact the way that we're able to support the community. And if I could add in, uh, Bill, I, I think those are really good comments from the people from the free store. Uh, one thing I want to emphasize again is that we had a big housing problem and an eviction crisis even before the pandemic began. And the housing advocates were able, before the pandemic struck, to get the city of Cincinnati government and also Hamilton County commissioners to uh, create modest programs of emergency rental assistance and mortgage assistance. And, you know, we needed those programs even before the pandemic, and we need those programs long term. Obviously, we need more right now because of the horrible pandemic that is uh, affecting us all. But we need these programs permanently. You know, when people are evicted, it's devastating. And, you know, that has been documented uh, We've talked about that in previous uh, community forums, but it, it, it bears repeating. Uh, evictions are terrible for the families and they're terrible for the community. And, uh, you know, having an emergency rental assistance is a small investment that pays huge dividends and we have to make these programs permanent. Good. Uh, I know new of our people out there have other questions. One the question, that um, I have is a generic question in terms of what can we as citizens do to help you on the front lines, uh, both at the free store, both with the affordable housing situation? What, what can we do in the coming weeks or months to uh, uh, do our role as citizens to make, make uh, your situations better in terms of dealing with these issues? And, uh... I just think to your point, Mr. Woods, uh, you mentioned this, the, the Ohio senators um, that we have, you know, is doing some sort of advocacy that they would push so that these funds can continue. But I'd also like to add from a different side that we may not always think about that there are private landlords, their owners who are struggling because they're not getting rent. And they could be once, uh, foreclosures begin again, they could be affected as well. We often think that most people live in big apartment complexes, but that's not accurate. Um, I've gotten pleas from a lot of landlords who are struggling um, to pay their mortgages because they're not receiving rent. Um, so this is going, this is really affecting, you know, both landlords and the tenants. And I know we focus on the tenants, but I will say that the landlords are struggling as well. Some of them. And I will kind of, <clears throat> I think the biggest concern or the biggest thing that I would state is when we look at major disruptions in the economy, realize it took four or five years for the last housing crisis to even get to something that people would call normal. This is, if the vaccine comes out tomorrow, we still have years of work ahead of us in some capacity. We don't know what that looks like. We don't know what the need's going to look like next week, next month vaccine day plus one plus 180 plus a year after the vaccine but it's going to take a long time for us to get back to um, 
pre-COVID economic status and and uh, and we're not even sure how to predict what that needs going to look like. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're in for a long haul. Hey, could I um, say a couple of words? Hi, this is Susan, Susan Noonan. So um, one thing I wanted to say, two, two ways, two little ways to help. Um, <clears throat> one, one of my organizations, the uh, FBI Cincinnati Citizens Academy, we're doing a virtual food drive right, right now. <clears throat> Excuse me, a virtual food drive for the food bank. And, and virtual food drives are a great way to support the free store because, you know, that gives them the money to buy the food and hoping that it'll be successful. We're doing it um, through the holidays. We started a couple of weeks ago. And then the other thing is um, any endorsements I'm on that endorsement committee for the affordable, the uh, charter amendment and um, working on a couple of endorsements right now that I'm hoping will come through. And, you know, that, that will jumpstart some money in the trust fund. So those are two ways we could help. Can you guys hear me? Yes, yes. thank you. Thank you. Okay, because I, I, you know, I'm so straight. This phone is so straight. I'm getting a phone call. It's showing his name, and I'm thinking, oh my gosh, what happened? Nobody will be able to hear me. But yeah, okay. Well, so those are just two things I wanted to bring up. Other comments or suggestions out there, or uh, to add to this discussion? Hey, John. Yes, hi, Sal. Uh, hey, how you doing? Hey, John, what's your sense of the filings on evictions thus far? And how many have we been able to, um, even though they've been filed, keep from being evicted? And, and um, any sense on the families that unfortunately have been evicted? Right. Well, th those are important questions. You know, there, there was a lull in the filing of evictions right. back in the springtime, but un unfortunately the filing of evictions in Hamilton County is back, back up to the pre-pandemic uh, levels. Um, you know, to the extent that families are able to have those evictions uh, halted using the, the CDC order, um, you know, many of those cases are being postponed uh, uh, to the end of the year, uh, there are still way too many families that have been evicted uh, in in the recent months. And you know, in spite of the best efforts of the Free Store and the Community Action Agency and uh, Tower House and Legal Aid, and uh, it's uh, it's not good. And it's unfortunately, unless we get an extension of. Uh, 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 delaying evictions and more financial assistance, it's going to be terrible. So it's, it's we're on the verge of a, of a huge crisis and it's critical for the, for the federal government to step in. And, and John, I, I totally agree. I, as one who makes a lot of phone calls, uh, you know, I hear support, um, but I, any, <laughs> any thoughts on how we can move from verbal support to action? Well, I, I expect there to be a, a, a very different look by Congress and, of course, the new administration uh, come January. And, yeah, and that I agree with, <laughs> but we've yeah, got to get through December. <laughs> it, yeah, right. We have to get through December. And, you know, fortunately, we still do have the CDC moratorium that we can uh, use to some degree to help people. And and we to be honest, we got to get through the first few weeks of the three weeks of January. <laughs> That's right. That's right. It, it's ridiculous that we have that gap. And, yeah. You know, Congress could do something still in the lame duck. And, um, you know, maybe it's a situation where the Ohio senators, uh, you know, the Brown and Portman can take the lead and, and do something, stop, stop, uh, some kind of stopgap measure to get us through January. Yeah, I agree. We've, we've got to do something. And, and I agree with you that we've got to get permanent fixes. Right, right. Yeah, and I really appreciate Bill bringing up the uh, local uh, housing trust fund, because uh, even if we're successful in getting more public investment in affordable housing uh, from the federal government, it's going to take a, you know, 
that'll take time and we need to do our own part locally here with with an affordable housing trust fund uh, the local housing coalition uh, advocates for affordable housing uh, supports that uh, and as does the homeless coalition uh, the homeless coalition and many others are working very hard in favor of the of the cincinnati charter amendment so regardless of what happens with that we need to have a fully funded local affordable housing trust fund John, is there, is is there a related uh, landlord crisis coming in terms of landlords, smaller landlords, particularly not having adequate funds to maintain their places? I don't really have a handle on that. Uh, a lot of landlords are taking advantage of the emergency rental assistance that has become available. Um, you know, I, I think that's a really important question that we should be looking at. And, you know, certainly there are, uh, you know, it, it, the landlords who provide housing at market levels or below are, are, are frankly, in my opinion, a mixed bag, but we need to support the good ones, right? And we, we need to be looking at policies that uh, make it possible for good landlords to provide good housing. In, even in some instances without government assistance. Uh, Michael Truitt brought up the point that uh, certain neighborhoods like uh, Columbia, Tusculum that aren't usually associated with being on the economic edge are now facing some big problems. And I, and I think one of you brought up the fact that uh, mortgage foreclosure is, uh, as well as eviction, is, is just like in 2008 was, a, was, a, was, was looming. Are you, are you worried about that uh, coming ahead? Absolutely. Foreclosures are a sleeping monster. And, you know, I don't know if things will get as bad as they got in 2008, 2009, and 2010. You know, we haven't even we have not even recovered from that in many ways. But you know, you know, there are quite a few, we know of quite a few families that are behind on their mortgages, and there are temporary procedures in place that are uh, preventing them from being foreclosed upon. But again, just like evictions in 2021, uh, we're going to need strength in public policies and assistance to try to head off another foreclosure crisis. Now I want to mention one other thing uh, that we haven't touched on yet and in, in, uh, in just to point out something that I think everybody on this call knows and, and that is that the, the pandemic and the housing crisis has really illustrated the, the racial injustice that we have in our society because the people affected the most uh, disproportionately are minorities uh, in our community. And um, you know, we, we have to pay special attention to that and really dedicate ourselves to making you know, really bold and meaningful change. You know, when the New Deal was done, uh, I was praising it a, a earlier on because of its uh, providing housing and jobs, but of course, the sad part of that story is that uh, that those programs were not really made available proportionally to minorities, and um, we continue to have this uh, system of discrimination in our country that we have to change. Do you, do you think, all, the three of you, that this may be a moment where people can uh, really empathize and see that some of these problems that persisted before the COVID-19 that have come so further back into play in people's minds, it, there's a moment to get people kind of saying, yes, we, we have to address these inequities. Any response? Well, I wonder what others on the call think about that. Uh, we've got lots of well-informed 
folks on the call. Yeah, that's that's a general discussion question. Uh, whether whether we're this is a, mo a moment where this can be further addressed than we've done in the past. Any com any comments or questions? I think what this underscores is the fragility of of a lot of people's situation. We've always heard people are two paychecks away from disaster. Well, very rarely has something so quickly and so impactfully tested that hypothesis and proven it. And it's, it's um, you know, I think that's something that people need to keep in mind. And if we do consider our advocacy efforts always you know, remember this circumstance and the importance of some of those social safety nets that one had either been systematically taken away over the past, I don't know, what's 1982 to now. Um, and remember that, hey, these safety nets, safety nets only exist for a reason. And remember 2020, what, what can happen? And, and so whether that's uh, across economic lines, racial lines, white collar, blue collar, really didn't matter. We're seeing it across the board because the fragility of, of a lot of individuals and or family circumstances. Great comment, thanks. I mean, it, it, just dovetailing on that, we've got a, I mean, we just know we don't have good paying jobs here and jobs with benefits or a lot of jobs where people get called off and um, and unfortunately, everybody appreciated the frontline workers for a couple of months. And then all of a sudden, you know, the bonuses went away, the recognition went away. Um, I, I don't think we appreciate nor recognize nor value, and I place value in terms of wages and benefits. Um, the workers that we're most dependent on, and um, um, I, and and we have to culturally change in our community. Um, I wanted to comment on the um, racial disparity aspect of the coronavirus. It's, it's getting a little better in September and October figures. And I don't know whether to credit that to um, things th that the agencies and health departments are doing, that the institutions in the minority communities are doing, or foolishness on the part of whites, but the... the um, a lot of the increase, and then of course, you know, going back to school and, and especially the universities, that that could be having an effect too. But it's it's encouraging that as we, even as the um, cases increase dramatically, we're going from about a thousand new cases, confirmed cases a month to closer to 2,000 cases a month. Uh, still, at the moment, the racial disparities are not increasing. I, I'm monitoring this on a monthly basis, so it may, it may have changed by next month, but that, that's just an encouraging note that the community can possibly be doing things that work, like you know testing and uh, contract tracing and all the things that can be done. As you told us before, two, two weeks ago, you're monitoring the COVID cases by neighborhoods, correct, Mike? That's correct. Have you seen other, or you're not looking at any other factors, related factors, uh, uh, besides the racial disparities? Uh, well, um, you know, the, the health department is keeping good statistics. We know that more women are getting the virus 
than men. Um, you know, is that because of exposure, you know, the kind of jobs that women have? Uh, is it that men just don't go get tested and therefore don't get reported? You know, we, we don't know why that is, but uh, out of over 7,000 cases, there's about a five or 600 gap between men and women, which is significant. Hey, Michael, it's good to see you. I haven't seen you in a while. And, you know, I think your, your comments are really important because to me, what they illustrate is the importance of making sure that we make decisions about public policy based on facts. And, you know, we want to know the facts and the facts will help us figure out, hopefully help us figure out our way out of this. Thank you. Good to see you, John. One thing before I, I wanted to get out before we uh, ended this, uh, and we don't have to end it any because we still have some time, but we, once again, I asked the question, uh, what can we do after this breaks off? You know, sometimes we say, I need to call my senator tomorrow. I need to call Senator Portman. I need to call... Uh, Congressman Winstrup, uh, what what are what I need to immediately donate one hundred and fifty dollars to the free store food bank? What are some of the th tangible things that average citizens who want to get involved can do um, immediately? <laughs> well, I like those those suggestions that you made, Bill. I, I think that we. Uh, as we were talking with Sally about earlier, it's important to put pressure on our all of our uh, congressional delegation to do something now in the, in the lame duck session uh, to uh, uh, extend the assistance that we that we have in place. And it's always a good idea to give money to the free store and other uh, organizations that are doing great work, including legal aid for that matter. <laughs> What do, you, what do you guys at uh, the free store think? This might be a little bit personal commentary um, as well, but we got to remember what governments do well and what they don't do well. And what they do well is fund and what they don't do well is things. So continue for them to allow any agency that is helping those in need to be funded and trust those doing the work to do the work so that they can continue on the safety nets and the CARES Act type funding and anything that, that any agency that's helping people out right now needs. So if you can advocate with your, your local, your state, your national politicians, remember funding above all, and that's what they tend to like to do and do well. You're asking them to set up the programs and all of that, they will struggle. But the funding is what makes us successful. That, that is so, so important, Michael. Um, the, the county decided to put CARES funds into coordinating test sites around the county. And um, they've set up a registry. And for example, all the public libraries are now becoming, uh, not every day, but you know, pop-up test sites and the, the YMCA's and WCA's and things like that. If it, without that county funding being put in the right place at the right time, um, the testing stuff wouldn't be um, getting more equitable as we go. Well, we're sorry that uh, Josh Spring isn't with us because he could have given us an update on what the coalition and the various shelters are facing. I know they're probably going to have to go through another round of making sure that funding for putting up homeless families and individuals in hotels is going to be maintained. They worked out with some federal money, but with a lot of local funding from the county uh, and from uh, the Greater Cincinnati Foundation and other uh, funders, as part of that package for dealing with uh, Putting, putting a large percentage of the homeless in 
in hotels. So um, we'll just we'll have to get another update from uh, from Josh on that. Any of you know uh, where that stands, uh, John or? Yeah, so I think I, I'm sure that Josh would tell us uh, that uh, the CARES money, or the emergency rental assistance money that's available now can only be used to keep people from being evicted. And so that money, it's a substantial amount of money, millions, um, is not available to help people who are homeless get into, uh, in, into housing. And you know, I think that's a gap. There, there is some money for that, for that, those activities, but I don't think there's enough. So I, I, I think we, we have a, a serious gap in our in our funding where, we're we're preventing evictions in a lot of instances, but for people who are homeless, uh, those who unfortunately did get evicted or lost their housing through other ways, we do have a shortage of affordable housing and a shortage of money to get people into it. And you're also gonna have a shortage um, with emergency shelters due to social distancing. So in years past, mm -hmm. um, even with the, um, the cold shelters, they were sleeping on top of each other. Um, right. They can't do that this year. So I don't know how they're gonna be able to house and maintain the CDC guidelines, those number of people, because it's getting colder now. Um, so that's gonna be a great challenge. So that is a good idea if someone could solicit the county commissioners to maybe because they, you know, they have control of those, of those CARES dollars. Um, well, when so Congress that, passed the HEROES Act way back in July, I believe, there was a considerable amount of money for local and state governments. And that money uh, didn't have strings attached to it except to be used for the kind of assistance that we're, we're talking about. So I guess, all of you have been talking about, we need that new package somehow passed in December to provide some of those funds. Well, right, Bill, and the, some of the money you're referring to that went to the state of Ohio ended up getting allocated very late in the game. And as things stand right now, that money has to be expended before the end of the year. Those deadlines just have to be extended. No question about it. Any other questions or uh, thoughts from, uh, from you all out there? What, one more comment. I, I did just hear that they have um, 5,300 signatures uh, for the charter amendment. So they're going to continue to get more, but that means that it would be on the ballot in May. Yeah, I think they're shooting for 8,000 just so that they don't. Just in that's case, not, yep. Yeah. Yeah. And that's because of social distancing and everything. That's proved to be a harder campaign, but they've been really out there, especially the last couple of weeks, getting those signatures. Right. I know Peg Fox has some kind of a, a drive-through um, sign up plan for a lot of the churches, but I'm not sure of the date, so. That's right, Metropolitan Area Religious Coalition is also supporting mm -hmm. the charter. Yeah. Yeah, that would, I guess that's why Peg is Peg has been very involved with the, the steering committee on uh, on the trust. She plan. is, yeah. She and she and Josh are doing a lot of work on it, and and they um they were the ones who answered all the questions. The Cincinnati Association. I'm trying to get Cincinnati Inclusion Panel to endorse it, and they had a whole lot of questions and um, about 35. And Josh and Peg, we had a conversation with them, a wonderful conversation actually. And they really were able to clear up so many of the questions that people had. So, so my hope is still that we can get that endorsement. That would be a good one. Other, other questions or thoughts? Well, I really appreciate the opportunity to talk with you all. And I, I want to encourage you to, you know, spread the word and, uh, Let's let's work on some uh, long-term solutions for the, for the problems that we that we have. Aha, uh -huh, you're uh, John. You're the chair of Aha uh -huh this year. They're having their annual meeting. Oh, thank I you. Believe, 
fairly yeah. soon. That's right. That, yes. that event will be the Tuesday before Thanksgiving. It's a virtual meeting and we're, we're having a great panel of, uh, of experts talking about various aspects of, uh, of the affordable housing crisis. So um, I think information about that will be coming out uh, any day now. So uh, it'll be at noon on the Tuesday before Thanksgiving. Thanks for bringing that up. And that's not a closed session, right? That's, no, it'll be open to the public. Good, good. So yeah, that would be a good place for a lot of people to learn. Yeah, we have we have a great panel of uh, people uh, lined up for that. Just to echo your comments, John, um, my eyes are set on the horizon in terms of when people talk about the other side, that enough deep change um, in spite of us has happened that we can begin to do some deeper level change in our institutions and also some long lasting change because often when a crisis is passed, people tend to go back to the familiar. And so that's what that, that deep and long lasting um, change is what, where, where my eyes are set. That is a very good, uh, very good point to make because uh, I remember when the homeless uh, crisis broke in the late or mid to late 1980s, everybody said, this is unacceptable. We've got to end this immediately, yet homelessness continued and increased. So we let that moment get beyond us. Uh, so what you're saying is uh, we cannot afford to let this moment pass. And this, we, we, this, this should be a moment where we can accomplish a lot of change. Yeah. Do more than make a sigh of in relief, um, but to just change the whole landscape if we can. We can, we just have to do it. That, that's a good, uh, good words to uh, end on because we need, we need some optimism at this point. Well, we'd like to thank our panel and if any, any of you um, have a final word, let, let us hear you now, but uh, we, we really thank your participation. This is a critical topic and uh, uh, we needed to, needed to address it. So uh, any final words from uh, our panelists? I just wanna say thank you for the opportunity to allow us to display the work that we are currently doing and thank you for the great work that Christ Church has done for many years in the community and then the issues that you that you all continue to bring up um, in these forum be, uh, vehicles. Well, thank you for what you do, Ryan and Michael and uh, John. And uh, of course, these forums will continue. Some, someday we'll get back to having them live at the church. But for now, we're, we're uh, doing them by Zoom. So we will not uh, reconvene uh, two weeks from today, but three weeks from today instead of on Thanksgiving. So have a good but safe and probably not usual Thanksgiving. And uh, thank you again for all of you for participating in this forum. Thanks a lot. Thank you all. Take thank care. Bye-bye. So long, Jim. <laughs>